Hey guys, it's been one of those weeks that I just can't wrap my head around. Um, technically, I am not live right now. This is pre-recorded, and that I hate that because I'd much rather be live with you guys today. Um, but we are having some internet issues related to the weather. This is not something that happens a lot. We do live in the valley. We do have the fastest internet in the country you can get being outside of Chattanooga and Gig City. But with torrential rain and wind, we just I, we have internet, but it's not sturdy enough for me to feel comfortable um, risking our material being chopped up or just not going through. So um, I am pre-recording this to hopefully upload everything so that at two o'clock Eastern time, you can still see it all. The only difference is at the end of the learning portion of the video, it's just gonna be over and I won't be able to answer your questions live. That being said, if you do have questions at any time during this broadcast, please go ahead and comment with your questions. That way um, this afternoon, I can go back and actually answer your questions for you. Um, and also with last week, we had a graphics card issue that is so that video that was cut off was corrupted in the replay or the, you know, me trying to broadcast that to you. So what we've decided to do is when we send out the replay information, I'm going to go ahead and send you that updated video with a complete material that was lost the handout and then the handout from today so thank you all for being patient um that is kind of the dar darker side of trying to do things virtually this is usually not a big issue but it happens and we just roll with it so we adapt that more and more options come available to us and we just make it happen so thank you for being patient for those of you who don't know me my name is andy barney and I own a professional service shop in Cumming, Georgia called Sewing Doc, where we um, are especially known for restoration and repair of older sewing machines. We do work on all machines, all home domestic machines and sergers. I don't do anything industrial, um, but we are one of the few shops left in the country that still have the ability to do complex things like gear replacement, touch and sews. We do um, a lot of work that just other shops are not set up or prepared to do. So we are trying to pass on everything that we um, do in our shop as a procedure to those of you um, that would like to absorb the mail so that you can learn to be more self-sufficient. We are we have less and less technicians every year. Um, COVID caused a lot of burnout. There's a lot of retirement going on. So we are trying to shift this entire industry to make it more uh, accessible for you to learn these skills and um, either just take care of your own machines or also provide a service to your community. So thank you for joining us on this journey. Um, I'm really excited for today's information. Um, I went through and recorded a, a couple different machines yesterday. So we're looking at about 30 minutes of learning material. This is the very basics on cleaning and the loop Fabricating your machine. This is if you have acquired a machine that's or it's one that's been sitting that you haven't used in a while. It's the bare minimum to make sure it's working and you could probably sew with it. I do recommend, you know, going through and getting a full service done or joining us in the Vintage Sewing Machine Mastery Program so that um, it can can be handled properly. But this is really just the very basics for a decent machine ready to go okay so i'm gonna get to that in just a minute i have a few other announcements i do want to remind you that jan i'm um, sorry june 6th is our um, virtual open house for the vintage sewing machine mastery and for those of you that are looking to go beyond um, our free material that we offer on youtube and facebook are going to show you on june 6th what exactly is in the vintage sewing machine mastery so this is basically leveling up and we call it mastery because it's teaching you um, to master the skills in vintage sewing machine uh, service repair and restoration. And that word mastery is different for everybody. So some of you are coming in with experience having poked around in Facebook groups and YouTube and picked up some things, but have a whole lot of holes in your knowledge. But it also starts with the absolute beginner. So if you've never even, if you're t intimidated or a little nervous to get into a vintage sewing machine for the first time, we have a starting point for you. Um, that's accessible the second that you, but then you have a live guidance between mostly myself, but also a whole community of people that are working through their skills. So we work collectively to get you to your goal. So for some people, their goal is just to satisfy a curiosity, keep this as a hobby because it's fun to go and hunt out cheap machines that just need a little bit of love and care and save them and either donate them to an, um, a family that needs it or, you know, um, a loan out program. And then there are several people in our group that after just a few weeks already started their own side business while they're building their skills. So we really do work to address and meet you where you are 
and bring you on the journey with us. So we are going to tell you all about that on Jan on June 6th. I don't know why you want to say January, um, but June 6th and doors will open for enrollment. They only open a couple times a year because we like to control the amount of people coming in so that everyone gets individual attention and that um, no one is ignored or left out. Okay, so that's going to be June 6th at 2 p same place and same time here here um, and that one will absolutely be live we have giveaways we're going to give away a custom hand turned seam ripper a few gift cards from other places and probably some fun tools that i love to collect from harbor freight so please join us and hear about what we're doing and it has expanded so much what it looks like now doesn't look anything like it did when we first had this mental concept years ago so i'm very excited um, for our next enrollment all right let's get with the material, um, like I said, none of this is live. This um, just is my disclaimer. The following material is pre-recorded. Um, if you would like a handout or um, a link to last week's material that just did not work out the way it was supposed to, please make sure you leave a comment um, just saying that you would like the information. You can word it however you want. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. I don't know exactly what you're talking about. You all have a great day. And if you have any questions, please reach out. And if nothing else, I will see you next week. I do realize that today is Memorial Day, but several people have said, don't skip Memorial Day. It's an excuse for me to get away from my family for a minute. So if that's you, I will be live on Monday. If you can't join us, then we'll get you on the replay. Have a great day. So we've already determined that everything about this machine is safe to plug in. The wiring is good. Um, the hand wheel turns. But we don't know how long this machine has been sitting. We don't know if it's been well cared for. This is another donation machine that came into our shop. Um, we have looked it over. Like I said, everything's deemed safe. It doesn't seem to need a lot. Um, what I'm going to cover in this um, cleanup and get ready to sew is the minimum. This is the very basics. This is not a full maintenance um, session. This is not, I wouldn't even call this service. This is really just the bare minimum. So let's just say that you found a machine in your basement and an estate sale and everything looks like it's this one, like it's pretty decent. Okay. And you don't, it, it might be a little dirty or dusty, but it doesn't seem like it's just been stored away and rotting somewhere. Um, I do recommend considering learning how to service and clean and maintain your machines yourself. Again, that is something we do cover in the Vintage Sewing Machine Mastery across all vintage machines. Very few of them are off limits. We do cover the whole gamut. Um, and it doesn't cover just one machine. You, you bring as many machines as you want. We help you with all of them. Okay. So what we're going to go through is the bare minimum you need. If you are an emergency and you've inherited a machine, whatever the case may be. Um, I wish that we'd had the opportunity to help you through this during COVID because it sure would have saved you a lot of time. The first thing I'm going to do is take the needle out and throw it away because we don't know how long it's been there. We don't know, probably don't know what type it is, nothing of that sort. So go ahead and dispose of your needle. Mine goes up here in the, um, the bin. All right. And um, I'm going to take off my presser foot. I'm going to go ahead on this machine. I'm going to take the bobbin out. Um, my hand wheel moves just fine with the, um, the clutch and well, maybe my hand wheel. Yeah. My clutch is just not connected. So we'll fix that here in just a second. Um, we're going to take off what few covers you can see. Most vintage machines don't have a ton of covers and, um, you can logically figure them out. Usually if you have a black cast iron, you're only going to have an access point in the back and the bottom is probably already open. On this particular machine, I am going to need a flathead screwdriver, I think, to remove a couple screws. So, let me go ahead and get these two screws out. this to the side and then this is going to lift off and I have access to the inside of the top of the machine. I'm going to go ahead and take the needle bar cover off. It just has a screw. I'm going to hold that so it don't fall. All right, now I have access into the machine. I'm going to go ahead and take the bobbin plate off or the needle plate. So all I have to do is lift up and pull out. And then we are going to take the bottom off. Make sure you know your parts in the way. I'm going to gently lay this on the back. Oh, this one doesn't have a bottom. This has the shafts and everything. So 
you can see that this one runs off of a Parsons shaft. All these moving parts does not have gears on the bottom. So while we're down here, um, you, I would normally start at the top. And if you have an air compressor, you can clean out in the top using an air compressor to get any lint or debris out. Um, I use a tip like this um, with no more than 30 to 35 pounds of pressure. And I always have a rubber tip so that if I bump the machine, I won't do any damage to it. So you can spray out the machine. Okay. And if you don't have um, an air compressor and there's a lot of dirt or um, dust in there, you can use Q-tips or brush to remove lint, but you don't want any lint in this machine. All right. And so this is kind of the fast track. If your machine is in good condition, that's the only time that this really applies. If you see any rust, any major buildup, all that stuff has to come out. And again, those are all techniques and things that we teach in depth inside of the vintage sewing machine um, um, mastery group. But what you can do here is I'm just going to take, this is a shop cloth, and I'm going to put a little bit of cred cutter on it. Again, if you have buildup, it's an entirely different process. But this, I just want to make sure that we're not missing anything that's going to gunk up. And all you have to do is just wipe down, and you can see it's taken some dirt out of there. Um, wipe down any places you see any dirt or oil or anything like that. We'll do the same thing up here on the top. The machine is really not in terrible condition. There's a little bit of junk here on the shaft. But more than anything, what I encourage you to do, because again, this is not a full restoration session. This is just to give you the basics to get going. Um, you're going to take sewing machine oil only. And I have suggestions in your handout. Um, Zoom Spout, Lily White, um, Blue Creeper, sewing machine oil. I will list all of these things. I'm using Blue Creeper today. It's all I use in my shop. And you're going to, let me actually fix my hand wheel here. If you are turning your hand wheel and nothing is happening, this is a very common issue. Um, this little screw I noticed is already sitting out, which is not correct. So I'm going to go ahead and take that screw out. I'm going to take this off. And see this up, oh, we're missing a washer. This is why. There should be a washer in here. That is unfortunate. So I'm not going to be able to turn this. Well, I kind of can. Um, usually this will not turn without the washer in there. So there should be a washer and then this has to go on properly. So in the meantime, I'm just going to use it while I can. What I was getting at is you may want to turn the hand wheel and you want to watch for where metal parts are moving against metal parts. When you're just doing this to get your machine going, it's not as vital. But anybody that's in our mastery group, I will repeat over and over and over again how important it is to put one drop of oil on all the parts with moving metal. That way you're not flooding the machine full of oil. You do not want to over oil your machine. I cannot tell you this enough. Okay. Um, but if you miss a spot, it's not going to be catastrophic. If you get too many spots, it won't be catastrophic. If you see any holes like this, those are oiling holes. So you're going to drop just a drop of oil. Let me, oh, my oil's closed. So I'm going to put a drop of oil in there. And then if I turn my hand wheel and you keep following down the shaft, you can see that this metal piece is moving between two forks. So we're going to put a drop of oil there, a drop of oil in the hole. And if you're just working on getting this machine going to see how it's working um, and it doesn't look too bad, you can go ahead and just put oil on the gears. Yes, they should re they do grease. I don't want to tell you what kind of, I mean, you can use Triflow or Super Lube or Petroleum on metal gears. Those are your, really your only three that I recommend. If you're following Facebook groups and they tell you all these other kinds of crazy things, follow that and heed my advice, though. Be cautionary, okay? There's only three things I will ever recommend, and there's a reason for that, okay? There are newfangled things. There's other people that just don't feel that it matters, but the, the weight and the, what it's made of really matters to me. So um, oil will work for now. And I'm going to keep following along. And there is a big gear. I don't know that I can get this in the shot very well, but you can see behind the cam stack here. Let me grab something to point with. Behind the cam stack, you're going to see this worm gear. And if it's got a lot of buildup, you're going to need to do a lot of scrubbing to get that out. And again, we do cover that in our workshop if you need help. But for now, I'm going to go ahead and oil just to make sure that this machine works okay. 
and you should still be turning your hand wheel. I really can't because my, my washer is gone. And then over here, there's an oiling hole at this end of the shaft. So I'm going to get one drop of oil down there. And then I'm going to move over here to the needle bar. And again, I'm not going to be able to move mine very well, but every place that you see metal move against metal should get a little drop of oil. You're going to see all these little oiling holes in there. So you're going to put one drop of oil either at the joint or where the oiling hole is. This is all part, these basic steps are part of our on-demand library in the Vintage Sewing Machine Mastery Group. That means as soon as you enroll, you have access to all of these basics. We walk you through complete cleaning out, taking it apart, cleaning it out, putting it back together, and oiling and greasing exactly where you need to. So this is really an abbreviated version. Um, so down here, we would, in the workshop, we would take out the, um, the bobbin case. And you're going to always put one drop of oil right here where the, the bobbin case rides on the hook. This metal part that turns is your hook. So I'm going to stick one drop of oil right here on the edge by the bobbin case. And when you turn your hand wheel, that's going to distribute the oil everywhere that it needs to be. And I can already feel this machine moving smoother, okay? Now, a few precautionary things. We never, ever, ever put any kind of oil or lubricant anywhere near the upper tension assembly. If you get oil or anything on your thread, it will affect the weight and the, the tension um, issues that you may have. We also never get oil on the, the belt, okay? So I'm going to turn this over. And the bottom is fairly easy. Again, it's going to be anywhere that you see metal move against metal. So I'm going to turn my hand wheel. And you can see there's more joints that move together. You can see um, where the big, this big um, shaft here connects. So I'm going to put a drop of oil in all of these joints. And it's just one drop. This is where, again, you do not want to ever flood your machine. Um, if it's frozen and not moving smoothly, we do have techniques for that that are very specific, okay? So I'm just going through and putting a drop of oil anywhere that metal moves against metal. And the best way to determine that is to keep turning your hand wheel and just watch, just observe. And you can see all the places where things are moving together. Okay. So that's, that's one example. All right. So let's go back to this one that we had assessed uh, last week with, um, you know, in last week's live. And uh, it does need some work. We already addressed the wiring. This motor is going to come off. I'm not going to cover all of that. I want to give you the basics on if you have a similar machine that you need to use um, and you just want to do the basics to get it going, that's what we're going to cover. Anything in detail is covered within the Vintage Sewing Machine Mastery Group um, and enrollment's opening on June 6th, okay? So um, on most of your cast iron machines are all going to be somewhat similar with some variations. Your slide plates do slide off. This one is being difficult. It will need to soak in a cleaner before it comes off, but I can at least get this one off to get in to get the shuttle out. I did already take the shuttle and the bobbin out. I took my foot off already. We can remove this plate unless your screw is stuck. It's not uncommon for these to be stuck. Uh, let's see if I can get this one off. Yeah. And maybe I can get it off around the slide plate. Yep. So I got that off and put this to the side for a minute. On the needle bar, you know, we checked all this. This is good. There's two screws. I am going to undo. If you have whatever screws you have, um, it may be a nodule one that sticks out right here. Be careful not to let the slide plate, this plate fall and hit your machine. So I'm going to get that screw out. All right, and now you can see inside the needle bar, which looks a lot different than the Singer one that we just looked at, right? So there's, um, everything's moving though, which is good. So it's gonna need a little cleaning and some lubricant. Um, Bob and Winder here, the hand wheel. And then in the back, we do have a cover here. So we're gonna go ahead and clean, move, remove this so we can get access in there. And there's some cobwebs and some dust. 
you can use brushes or whatever you need to clean out. I personally use an air compressor because I clean so many machines. So let me go ahead and just get some of this removed. And I am just going to go ahead and go all the way around the machine. We do have one more access cover here and the one 27, 128, 27, and 28 family, there's usually an access. And I'm actually just going to swing this upward and you can get, you can see where we can get to the, one of the main um, shaft joints there, right? So yeah, when you turn the hand wheel, you can see this moves the take up lever. So this machine is moving, but it's moving very slowly. If And I feel like lubricating it uh, and getting it a little bit cleaned up will let you know how bad it is. Um, so let's just do some basics here. I am going to put a little bit of crud cutter on a shop cloth. Um, crud cutter is one of the chemicals I use regularly. If you have buildup anywhere, you will need some other um, materials. Blue Creeper is our first choice. Um, I will talk about that here in a bit. But I'm just going to put a little crud cutter on my shop towel. And I'm going to wipe everything down that I can see. This one's a little bit worse than that last singer was. So you can see it's coming. It's bringing out a lot of dirt. So take your time and clean all of the metal parts that you can see. Move your hand wheel to make sure you access as much as you can. And you're going to do this all the way around the machine on all the moving parts um, where you have access. So let's see if we can get back here to the back. While this was dusty, it doesn't seem to be very dirty. It definitely is very dry of lubricant, right? If you can see in there, it's not terrible. And then let's look at the bottom here. Um, the bottom was also a little dirty, so I'm going to take a fresh shop cloth. And I will get this wiped down. And yeah, so you can see it is definitely bringing up a lot of dirt. So um, you, in our workshop, we do teach to clean and various methods. There's so many different methods we teach to clean. You can see there's actually some rust over here um, to kind of preserve the integrity of the machine. Um, we're giving you a brief overview here, but I do teach in our workshop how it basically the clean the machine needs to be clean enough to eat off of is kind of our shop philosophy. When we're doing a restoration for a customer, um, this needs to be impeccable and as clean as much as possible. For the sake of this presentation, we will we're doing just the basics. So um, I want to make sure that this machine is moving well, more or less, is what we're doing. So once we get all that, we're going to start lubricating the machine, which is what it needs more than anything. Um, so if it's a you know if it's a um, a motorized machine with electric, you definitely want to make sure it's lubricated before you run it too much. So again, we're going to turn the hand wheel and you're going to watch for places where metal move against metal. And that's pretty much every joint that you see here. So I'm going to get one drop of oil in every spot um, that you see a, either an oiling hole or a joint where metal moves against metal. One drop. We're not dousing anything. We're not... Um, Oh, we, we are not over oiling this machine. Okay. And the more you move, you're probably going to see some more spots that one need cleaning and that need lubrication. So let me get a little bit more over here. Now in our workshop modules, we do teach you exactly where to oil. It's not just a guesswork of just put it where you think it goes. We do actually cover logistics and um, specifics in the workshops. I'm gonna turn my hand wheel a little bit. Every time you turn your hand wheel, that's allowing the oil to get into the places that it needs. I am gonna put one more drop of oil right at the base of this shaft. Okay, that definitely helps. So let's get back up right here. Yeah, see, it's starting to move a little bit easier. Let's get over here to the needle bar. 
And we are still going to put one drop of oil every place that metal moves against metal. Let me prop this up, maybe. I'm going to prop this up where you can see. All right, so if I turn my hand wheel, I can see that there's a big shaft moving back there. There's a big, that big circle in the back. I need to get one drop of oil back there. I know you probably can't see that in this particular video. I'm a little more limited than I am in our normal light, um, workshop. So, but you can see um, the needle bar here. I'm going to put a drop here because it moves down. The presser foot here because it goes up and down. This little screw. And then if we come over here to the front, that access panel, that's the joint that moves the take up lever. So I am going to put just a drop of oil up here. And again, it's going to seep in where it needs to. So don't worry about dousing anything. And it's starting to move a little better. There are some oiling holes up here on the top. I'm going to put one drop in each of those. And also while we're here, you can see this is moving. I am going to put a drop of oil up here because it does move up and down in that space. I'm going to put a drop of oil under the, um, the presser foot pressure knob. So let me make sure that moves. Now over here in our bobbin winder, this should be cleaned up more, but this is not moving very well. There's an oiling hole here. You're going to put one drop of oil in there. And there we go. Now it's spinning freely. You may need to oil down here in this little spring. So I'll put a little bit of oil there. All right, let's get back here to the back. I'm gonna prop up again. And we're gonna do the same thing back here. We're gonna move everywhere that you see metal move against metal. So there's a big, uh, I don't even know what you call that. It kind of rotates there, but you can see the moving parts. You just wanna get a drop of oil in there. And I'm gonna keep repeating myself as I do in my workshops with our um, participants. Um, it's one drop of oil and once, cause that way, if you are hitting way too many points, you're not over oiling the machine. Okay. And it's going to migrate to where it needs to be. So please don't be ridiculous with your oil that causes more issues in machines than it helps. And then right here next to this bobbin winder, I'm going to put a drop in that hole. That's for the main shaft. I actually see a little corrosion in this machine. It's not something I'm terribly worried about. All right, and I think that's all of our oiling holes. So now, with it being lubricated, now the wheel is moving so smoothly and easily, and it doesn't make that whining noise that it was making. So that's the basics on getting your machine going. Obviously, there's a lot more in depth if you want to really rehab this machine and give it some life, but that's the very basics on getting it going. All right, so the reason that I'm pulling this one out, um, and as I've mentioned in the previous segment, um, there's only two things I recommend for cleaning the exterior of your vintage and antique machines. Now, there are a lot of options out there, um, and I do talk about all of them at length in our in our mastery group um, and on demand library, and I have in most of my live material. Um, if you're in the Facebook groups, you will see a lot of controversial topics on what to clean machines with. You want to protect the decals, the clear coat as much as possible. Most of them already have some issues with the clear coat, so we don't want to make them worse. We'd like to make them better if we can. So I pulled this machine out. This machine needs so much work, um, so it's not going to be a moving machine, but it is also my best example of a really dirty machine. Now, I can't just wipe this off. You can see this is actually kind of in there. So it's a good example to show you on the best cleaning techniques, okay? So the first thing I would do is clean it off. What I, I, I love an air compressor for this reason, okay?
So you want to get as much off there as you can. Um, that's really not doing it. So I am actually going to take a dry cloth and very super gently. You do not want to grind this dust into your finish. So I'm just going to try and remove, you know, what I can without, and you, here you can see, um, with this is, I am barely putting any pressure. Okay. And now I went through the gamut of what you can use. My only two big suggestions are Blue Creeper, which we do give away um, if you enroll on June 6th into our Vintage Sewing Machine Mastery group. You do get the Blue Creeper for free. Um, and we also, I do take a lot this bottle and put some into a spray mister bottle, 99 cents at Walmart. Um, I like to conserve this bottle of Blue Creeper like I said before, does last a lot. I can probably get about 60 machines out of this one bottle. Um, and I do a lot of machines. So with the Mr. Bottle, I can do even better. So I'm going to take my shop cloth. You're going to want to use either like a microfiber towel or just, I prefer the really soft shop cloths because they're disposable. And you're going to spray a light mist on the machine. Let me see if I can get my lighting a little better down here. And I'm going to gently wipe. And again, you don't want to apply much pressure, but I do want to wipe away and I want to make sure I'm using clean spots uh, of the towel so that I'm not spreading the dirt and the grit around. Okay. So you can see already the improvement. And I'll go over the area gently a couple times because again, I'm not grinding it into the finish but I imagine some of this dirt over time has ground itself into um, the finish. So use a lot of fresh, clean towel for this. Now it's probably going to dull a little bit again as it dries. But that's a vast improvement um, on cleaning this machine. <laughs> so let's get over here to where the badge and um, I'm going to use this to gently wipe way what's loose well, practically speaking if you are really doing this on a machine go ahead and wipe the whole machine down to get the loose stuff off before you start cleaning in the interest of time i'm just kind of working a little more quickly than i would so i'm going to mist over here you just want to be careful if your machine has a belt not to get the blue creeper on the belt Okay. And Blue Creeper does address rust. Now this one is pretty rusted. I'm probably going to use a couple other techniques to get this post clean. We do cover restoration on rusty parts in our mastery group. But um, Blue Creeper, if you have surface rust, it will definitely prevent it from getting worse. And it will kind of reverse it to some degree. So you can see what a difference this Blue Creeper is making on this machine. Um, and, it, or, and so in machine oil is your other option. Um, you, you can use kerosene or any of those flammable things if you like. Um, I don't think it's the best choice because of the flammability and the fumes, but a number of people still use that as their go-to. Um, I wouldn't, I am not a fan of the other options. A lot of people swear by Gojo um, without the, uh, abrasiveness in it. That's really just not my, I don't know. It makes me nervous. I've seen too many people dull the finish more with something creamy like that that can soak into the finish. So I'm just working my way around. And I keep discarding these and grabbing clean ones. So now up here, I'm in another area where I'm going to have to clean off some of this residue before I keep going. In our mastery group, I will teach you how to take apart the upper tension assembly because you can see this one's pretty bad. Um, it would, it's definitely going to have to come apart to function properly. So let me get a little blue creeper up here. And I do use the shop towels. This is why I don't like using paper towels for one. A paper towel would rip and shred all over the place at this point. But you can see I just flossed all of that dirt buildup or whatever that is out of that little hole. Um, and I can do the same thing here around the tension assembly. 
Just be careful not to disturb the spring if you've got one on there. So you get the idea. This is you're just going to keep working your way around. This at least gives you a clean surface. So take a look at this um, in comparison to what it looked like uh, when we started. Okay, so that is my